What's up everybody? I am back. I'm done making excuses. My desk is a little dirty. I haven't shaven in a while and I'm swamped with work, but enough pushing this off. I have a ton of videos coming up, including a cram session video series, which I think you're really gonna like. Today we are on chapter four. Let's go. Hi there, welcome to chapter four of the North Carolina real estate exam practice questions. Today we'll be covering the transfer of title to real property. If you're looking for the real general chapter four review video, I'll have that linked somewhere up here in the corner or down in the description. For those of you who have followed me for a little while now and for those of you who might care, I have been flipping a cabin up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina specifically on Beach Mountain. They're now up for rent on Airbnb and VRBO and doing way better than we had originally thought. But it basically turned a dump of a cabin into something that's extremely, well, I think is beautiful and I'm extremely proud of, but I have the entire flipping journey series on my other YouTube channel, which will also be linked right up here. So subscribe if you're new, hit that like button so I know you're enjoying some of this content. And I just recently partnered with the Superior School of Real Estate, so, Use the link down in my description below where they sometimes have discounts on their courses and I get a tiny piece of the pie. So help me while I'm helping you. Anyway, enough talking about this introduction stuff here. I won't be doing that as much in the next chapters. It's just, I've missed you guys. So here we go. Question one, voluntary alienation during life occurs only in which of the following ways? A, a will, B, foreclosure sale, C, D, delivery, or D, devise. So the keyword here is voluntary. A will means death. That's not voluntary, right? Foreclosure isn't voluntary. That's basically the bank taking the house away from you almost by force. Devise deals with a will and death again. So D, delivery, C is the answer. Question two, which of the following is the type of notice provided by recording? A, actual, B, reasonable, C, protective, or D, constructive. So the answer here is known by knowing keywords and terms. You are gonna need to know a lot of those in all of these chapters. So reasonable doesn't make sense here. And I'm not sure protective is a real notice. Actually, notice is more about knowing that a real estate transaction is going on. Uh, but constructive notice is the notice provided by recording. It's just the keyword to know. The answer here is D. Question three, essential elements of a valid deed include all of the following except A, acknowledgement, B, writing, C, competent grantor, or D, execution by grantor. So this was always really tricky for me to comprehend, but a deed is a written instrument, right? It needs a competent grantor, identity of the grantee, words of conveyance, adequate land description, consideration, signature of grantor, the execution, witnesses, and deliver. But the tricky part here is that it should be acknowledged and recorded to give public notice. But it is still a valid deed without acknowledgement. Question four, the purpose of a deed being acknowledged is to make the deed valid, make the deed eligible for delivery, C, make the deed eligible for recording, or D, identify the grantee with certainty. Okay, so here we go. A deed should be acknowledged, as I said on the previous question. That'll make it eligible for recording. So C, see this is exactly why this test is some bull. The last question says the deed doesn't need to be acknowledged, right? But here we are saying why it should be acknowledged. It doesn't need to be, but it should be. And that's what I'm saying. So the answer was C, make the deed eligible for recording. Question five, a general warranty deed and a quit claim deed are equally suitable for which of the following? Judicial deed, deed of confirmation, official deed, or deed of gift? So judicial is around foreclosures, deed of confirmation, I'm not sure it's even covered. Um, I think C is a little bit of a trick here because that's not an official term. So it is technically correct because a deed that is official is covered by the general warranty deed quit claim. But the deed of gift is the more correct answer here. The answer is D. Question six. All of the following are methods of title assurance except color of title, title insurance, covenants of title in the deed, title examination by an attorney. So as a buyer, they talk to attorneys quite a bit through the transaction process here in North Carolina. 
right? Attorneys will have you sign a document which will cover title insurance and title examination and one other thing on this list here. So covenants are certain guarantees that the seller gives which are on the deed or title. So we are left here with a color of title which I can't tell you the definition here. Probably look that up but this is something I've never heard of before. I don't even remember seeing on the test. Uh, but I guess probably study it. Keywords are important. Uh, answer here is A, color of title. Question seven, the type of deed used to remove a mortgage lien when the debt is satisfied is A, deed of surrender, grant deed, deed of release, or special warranty deed. So deed of surrender is something that transfers ownership over a certain period of time, not grant deed and not a special warranty deed. So the answer is deed of release, C. Question eight, of the following types of deeds, which provides the grantee with the greatest assurance of title? Special warranty, deed of confirmation, grant deed, or general warranty? So this is a key word again here. Special and general are the two terms we deal with quite a bit in these courses, but the special warranty is, quote, used to convey property in North Carolina from a grantor to a grantee. This one is limited in scope, so it does not provide a warranty for past owners. General warranty deed covers all of it. The answer here is D. Question nine, which of the following covenants assures the grantee that the grantor has the legal capacity to transfer title? Covenant of quiet enjoyment, covenant of right to convey, covenant of season, or covenant of warranty. So quiet enjoyment is a promise that the new owner can live there essentially in peace. Right to convey is the legal right to transfer. So already B is our answer. Season is very similar, but it is just saying the owner does own what he says he owns, but in less of a legality, legal type of way. You know, I get quite a few emails from other students who are trying to find tips for passing this course, and I should probably add reading the whole entire back of the dictionary of this book. Question 10. Which of the following types of deeds is typically used where one is releasing any interest he or she may have in a parcel of real estate? Quit claim deed, special warranty deeds, grant deed, general warranty deeds. So we went through the warranty deeds already. Those are protections. Answer is A, quit claim deed. It transfers the interest of the grantor to the grantee. Question 11, a grantor left a deed for the grantee to find after the grantor's death. The result was to convey the title during the grantor's life, convey the title after the grantor's death, have the title automatically as sheet to the state, or none of the above. So I'm not entirely sure I understand what this question is asking, if you didn't see the confusion on my face, but the title would go to the beneficiary and the deceased owner's will or the heirs if no will is made. So the answer here is C or D, D, none of the above. And this is probably why I was confused by this question. None of the answers are there. Question 12, in a meets and bounds description, the description must close. That is, it must do which of the following? This one is kind of logical. End at the northeast corner of the property, end at the point of beginning, end at a known government marker, none of the above. So property boundaries must close, right? You can't have a property with a U-shaped border. Where would your property and your bounds begin and end? So countries have borders, houses have property lines, I have a personal bubble. The property closes where it begins, B. This is kind of a stupid question because it's so logically dumb that it could easily throw people off. Northeast corner kind of makes sense if you were to go maybe counterclockwise to fill in a square or something like that. So I can see how that could be a, a mistake. Don't overthink some of these things. Yeah, a, of course a parcel of land ends where it begins. You know, it has to finish the loop. So question 13. If the covenants in a general warranty deed are broken, the grantee's remedy is which of the following? Sue the grantor for damages in the amount of the loss up to the amount of the purchase price only. Require the grantor to execute a deed of confirmation only. Both sue the grantor for damages in the amount of the loss up to the amount of the purchase price and require the grantor to execute a deed of confirmation or none of the above. And we're just gonna get straight to this one. If the grantor breaks their end of the bargain, sue them. <laughs> Usually, I'm not actually about suing people, so I don't mean it like that, but in this case, sue them, sue the grantor. 
Usually your firm will have a legal team or something like that that has your back on stuff like this. At least mine does. <coughs> Join Keller Williams <laughs> and put me down as a sponsor. The answer here is A. Really though, this isn't an agent's legal battle. This would be the buyer's battle. Question 14. The covenants in a general warranty deed will protect the grantee A. Against the lawful claims of all persons whomsoever only against the lawful claims arising from the grantor's period of ownership, C, only if the grantee acquires a valid title insurance policy, or D, never, the general warranty deed provides no protection from the grantor to the grantee. As stated in the past already, general warranty deeds have the most protection. A is going to be the answer here. Against the lawful claims of all persons, whomsoever, current owner, previous owner, etc., Question 15. A claim of title by adverse possession may be defeated by the property owner by which of the following? Permission, confirmation, will, or condemnation. So let's start by defining adverse possession. It's when someone takes land with five elements, open and continuous, exclusive, sorry, open and notorious, exclusive, hostile, statutory period, and continuous. So once the owner of the land gives permission for someone to use, it's no longer adverse possession. The person using that other person's land can't get ownership now. It's no longer hostile. So the answer here is A. Phone is blowing up. Question 16. A buyer recently purchased a lot containing 0.3817 acres. How many square feet does this lot contain? 24,275, 21,875, 17,825 or D, 16,627. So this is very easy. You just take that 43,560 square feet that are in an acre and multiply that by the 0 0.3817 to get the final answer of D, 16,627. Mm -hmm. So I don't really remember the easy way of knowing that 43,560. Someone's left it in my comments below, but it's something about like, Four grandmothers driving 35 in a 60 mile per hour zone or something. Somebody comment down below. I'll tag it. I'll pin it to the top there so we can all remember that. I forgot what, yeah, 43,560. It's something about four old grandmothers. So comment down below. Question 17. The type of deed that guarantees the title only against defects that were created during the grantor's ownership is which of the following? General warranty, special warranty, surrender, or release. So this is another general warranty, special warranty thing. General covers all previous owners, as stated before. Special only covers the current ownership or the, the grantor's ownership, the one giving the property. So the answer here is B, special warranty. Question 18, which of the following statements regarding a title examination is correct? The purpose of the title examination is to reassure the purchaser the seller had good and marketable title, to determine if there are any items recorded or not that might negatively impact the seller's title, or C, the purpose is to determine the quality of title, or D, the title examination only includes items released to title and does not typically include liens or property tax matters. So I personally would say A, B, and C are all correct. So C is the real answer here according to the book, but C already reassures the purchaser like in answer A, and B is mostly correct, but recorded or not is probably what hurts that answer. I don't know, but the answer here is going to be C. The purpose is to determine the quality of title. Question 19. If a person dies into state and has no heirs, his property will blank to the state, devise a sheet, demise or grant a sheet is the keyword of it going back to the state this is more memorization here um, answer is b a sheet i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that right question 20 with reference to the meets and bounds property description which of the following is correct a it is a description by distances and directions b it is the primary method of description used in the original 13 colonies C, it must have a point of beginning, or D, all of the above. So meets and bounds is the old way of saying next to that rock, 10 feet from that cliff, one foot from the bear-shaped tree. 
The government rectangular system is more of like the Western stuff. Answer is D, all of the above here. Question 21, a title insurance policy can be written to protect all of the following except owner, seller, lessee, or mortgagee. So the policy is to protect the current owner, which is also the lessee if renting, and mortgagee, the one providing the lender for the one owning it. Seller is not what gets the policy, it's for the buyer. Answer it here is B, seller. Question 22, the successive conveyances of a title are called A, releases, B, remises, <laughs> C, links in the chain of title, or D, abstracts of title. So by how I said that, you know B probably is not correct because I've never read that or said it out loud in my life. So I do believe that this answer is pretty simple. C is the answer, but it may also just be called chain of title usually. Links in the chain of title is a little different. Uh, answer is C. Question 23. A title insurance policy protects the insured against loss caused by defects in the title existing at the time the insured acquired titled, defects in the title created during the insured's ownership, C, defects in the title created after the insured's ownership, or D, all of the above. So title insurance is typically talking about previous moments in history. The answer is A, defects in the title existing at the time the insured acquired title. Question 24, a tract of land measuring 165 feet wide, 350 feet deep, recently sold for $138,600. What is the price per front foot? 41 cents, $269, $396, or $840. So they trick you here by giving you way too much information, which they do that a lot on these math problems. Just take the $138,600, divide it by the 165 feet wide, because that is the front foot, to get $840. We don't care about the depth here. It doesn't matter how deep this lot is, we want the front foot. So answer is D, $840. Question 25, of the following types of deed, which provides the grantor with the greatest liability? Special warranty, deed of confirmation, grant a deed, or general warranty deed. This is the opposite of a previous question. General warranty deed gives a buyer the greatest protection for the fifth time. Therefore, it gives the seller the most liability. D is the answer, general warranty deed. Question 26, which of the following legal, legal descriptions would not be considered adequate for conveyance in a deed? These allergies. A, reference to meets and bounds, reference to a previous recorded deed, informal reference, reference to plat book and page. So informal reference is an address like 123 Main Street. That is not adequate. A deed is a very formal document and it should be very precise. No room for C, informal reference. That's the answer. Which one would not be considered? C, informal reference. 27. Carla recently purchased a tract containing 6.48 acres for $79,035. What would be the selling price of a 50 by 225 foot section of this land if she sells it for the same cost per square foot that she had originally paid for? $3,150, $6,300, $11,250, or $40,178. This is a big span here. Okay, so we take the acreage here, 43,560 square feet, multiply by 6.48 acres, because that's how many square feet we have per acre, and we have 6.48 acres. So multiply those together to get 282,268.8 square feet. Then divide the price, the $79,035, by 282,268 dollars and eight cents to get 0.28 cents per square foot. Now the section of land is found by doing 50 by 225 feet, which is the section size they give you there, for 11,250 square feet. So that amount at a 28 cents price per square foot, you multiply that by the 11,250 square feet, we get $3,150, which answer is A. 
Question 28. Lucy Landlord owns a house that she leases to Tim Tennant. Which of the following estates and real property exists during the time of Tim Tennant's lease? Leasehold estate, freehold estate, neither a leasehold nor a freehold, or both a leasehold and a freehold. So the quick answer here would be A. It's a leasehold because we're talking about renting, but it's also still being held as a freehold estate by the enter, those two by the owner. Sorry, those two things work in conjunction together. The answer here is D, both a leasehold and a freehold. If someone is renting a property, there's still somebody that owns that property, right? Question 29, which of the following is an adequate property description? 123 Smith Road, North Carolina, we already determined that is not. The Old Martin Place, no. C, book 1968, page 924, Halifax County, North Carolina, yep, or none of the above. So A is the informal description like we discussed previously, no. B is just local talking to a local about some location, that's not good. C, book and page are great examples of valid descriptions. You write this almost every time you write an offer to purchase. Answer is C. Question 30, a blank property description has a point of beginning. Again, kind of went through this. A government rectangular system, legal, points and calls, or meets and bounds. So the government rectangular system is a general square. There's no start point really. Legal and point of calls are really irrelevant here. Meets and bounds is where you say from that rock to that tree to that cliff back to that rock. So the answer here is D, meets and bounds. Question 31. A home is sold for $103,250. What is the amount of excise tax to be paid by the seller? 206, 207, or 103, 104? So Look, math is a very easy way to get 100% on this test, at least on the math portion there. You know 100% that they're going to ask you every type of math question, but you don't know if they're going to ask you these other random questions, like who takes title? They're definitely, they're definitely going to ask you excise tax questions and, and every specific math question you can think of. So excise tax is $1 for every $500 here. $103,250 divided by that $500 is $206.50. You round up, answer is B, $207. They try to trick you there, you round up with excise tax. B, <laughs> question 32, a tract of land measuring 750 feet by 825 feet is divided into two tracks by a stream that runs diagonally through the property. We've got some, what is this, algebra here? or geometry. How many acres are in each portion of the property? 14.2, 10.65 acres, 7.10 acres, or 3.55 acres. So 750 by 825 feet is 618,750. Then you divide that lot by two to get 309,375, because we said we divided it into two tracks, that divided by 43,560, which is the amount of square feet per acre, is 7.10 acres in each part. They try to trick you with that diagonal part here, but it's actually not used at all. So really it's not geometry or whatever. Question 33, two adjoining lots contain the same front footage. Lot A is 900 feet deep and lot B is 780 feet deep. If lot A contains 3.45 acres, how many acres are in lot B? And then you round the width. So 2.99 acres, 3.9 acre, 3.98 acres, 5.56 acres, or 16.11 acres. So this one does take a little bit of multiplication and division. There are 43,560 square feet in an acre. Lot A is 3.45. So you multiply that by the 43,560, which equals 150,282 feet. That divided by 900 feet is 166.98, and that's our front feet of the lot now. It says both lots are the same front footage. So now 166.98 times 780 feet deep 
is 130,244.4 feet inside the lot. So how many acres is that? You divide that now by the 43,560 square feet that are in an acre to get 2.99 acres. The answer here is going to be A. <sighs> that wraps up the practice questions for this video. Up next is chapter five on land use controls, which has a lot less questions and is quite a bit easier in my opinion. I just have to say, if you're going through some of these questions, you might be getting ready to start taking the exam, which means you are going to start looking for a firm to affiliate yourself with soon. By now, you may know that I'm with Keller Williams and I really should launch a video soon on why I actually chose them specifically, but I would highly recommend for them to be on your call list definitely interview with that company. And if you decide to join them, I'd be forever grateful if you put me down as a sponsor with them. It means a huge deal at Keller Williams to be a sponsor for someone. I would love to be yours. It also means that you and I would be great referral partners. So if I have a buyer that I know moving to your area of North Carolina or anywhere in the country, I could refer them over to you and kind of vice versa. They have a whole system for that kind of thing. But please consider Keller Williams, if, even if you don't put me as a sponsor. They're, Pretty awesome. Anyway, see you on chapter five. Thanks.